But nowadays, there's a lot going on in the field, and major discoveries have been made that have now created opportunities to treat very serious human diseases. And I thought I would take a moment to uh, give you a little history uh, with respect to two discoveries in the field uh, that are attracting a lot of attention in the clinical world today. The first of those has to do with the mechanism of influenza virus infection, which is also what we call the flu. And the second has to do with the way that white blood cells, also called leukocytes, attach to endothelial cells, which are the cells that line your blood vessels. It turns out when your white blood cells start to stick to the side of your blood vessels, that can lead to inflammation, which is involved in a variety of different diseases. So let's start by talking a little bit about the flu. Now, influenza uh, has been a major global health problem, uh, dating back really you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. But one of the first documented pandemics of influenza uh, was the famous pandemic of 1918, which wiped out a huge portion of the population. Over 70 million deaths have been attributed to this particular flu pandemic, which, by the way, is more deaths than were associated with World War I and World War II combined. So this was a major killer back in the early part of the 1900s. And in fact, scenes like this one, in which huge warehouses or even airplane hangars were cleared out and just lined wall to wall with beds with infirm patients who were you know, trying to survive their bout with the flu. This was a common image during that period in history. And movies have been made about this crisis, and certainly many books have been written about this crisis. And this was a lesson to humanity that the influenza virus, although many of us get the flu and, and we recover just fine, that this should not be taken lightly. The influenza can be very deadly, particularly for elderly people and for very small children. So for this reason, over the last decade, there's been a lot of work in developing influenza vaccines. And it's been a very difficult problem because, as many of you know, the flu is a highly shifting and changing virus. It can mutate very rapidly so that the strain of flu that we get vaccinated against this year, that strain morphs and changes and next year it's different enough that the vaccine no longer works. For that reason, scientists and physicians are always trying to stay one step ahead of the flu. And every year you go in for another flu shot, which hopefully will protect you from that year's influenza strain, although it might not do much for the subsequent year and so on. But nonetheless, with the advances of the last decade or two, uh, we now have fairly reliable flu shots that we can get every year. And hopefully you go in and, and get your flu shot. And I pulled this image off of the web because I thought you might be interested to hear that the flu vaccine is actually generated in chicken eggs. We use those eggs as little factories to make these vaccines. And what you're looking at here is, is a scientist who's basically injecting eggs with a flu strain that will then propagate within those eggs. Uh, so try and get your flu shot if you can. However, as many of you know who've been paying attention to the news in recent months, uh, just because you get protected against what we think will be next year's flu strain doesn't mean you're protected against all forms of influenza. And one of the most scary features of influenza is that sometimes it has the ability to move from one organism to another. So there are strains of influenza that normally make birds sick, and some of those have been so catastrophic to poultry industries that there's interest in vaccinating chickens against the flu, the same way that we vaccinate ourselves against the flu. But if bird flu gets into a human, it can make that human very sick. And so many of you have probably heard about these local incidents of bird flu uh, in humans, and this is a map showing you where some of those bird flu cases have been identified. So far, the good news about bird flu is that although we might catch it from a bird and get very sick, it doesn't look like we then can transmit it to another human. Now, this is not the case with the most recent scary uh, outbreak of influenza, which has been called the swine flu. This is a flu that's thought to have come from pigs and then moved into humans. It's also called H1N1 influenza. And I'll show you in a minute where those terms come from. But basically, the swine flu can go from pigs to humans, but now it can also go from humans to humans, which means the swine flu is a much bigger risk 
for a pandemic because of human to human transmission. Fortunately, so far, it looks like it's a fairly mild form of the flu. But there have been many cases reported, most of them in North America, and many of them here in the United States, as you can see from this map. So there are many reasons why we want to understand at the molecular level how influenza works so we can develop better vaccines and also generate drugs to help treat people who have contracted the flu, where a vaccine is really you know, not relevant anymore. So there's been a lot of research on the influenza virus, right down to the individual molecules that are involved in the infection cycle. And what was discovered, starting back in the 1970s and 1980s, is that the very early stages of influenza virus infection involves sugars. And in fact, that stage is the stage at which the influenza virus particle, which is shown here in this electron micrograph, attaches to a human host cell that it's destined to infect. There are sugars involved in that very first interaction between the particle and the host. Now, also the host generates new viral particles, which then bud and leave the host. And it turns out there are sugars involved in that step as well. And let me show you how. Okay. So here's a cartoon that illustrates the anatomy of the influenza virus. It's a membrane enclosed virus that has a core that has both RNA and proteins. But there are two proteins that sit on the membrane envelope of the virus. And those proteins go by the name hemagglutinin, which I abbreviate H, and neuraminidase, which I abbreviate N. And remember, the swine flu is more scientifically termed H1N1. Well, the H1 is a certain form of hemagglutinin, and the N1 is a certain form of neuraminidase. Now, we know quite a bit about what these two proteins do. In fact, we even know their molecular structures in very great detail. Hemagglutinin is a receptor. It's a protein that binds to a sugar, and that sugar happens to be sialic acid, which I mentioned before. Neuraminidase is an enzyme. And what neuraminidase does is it catalyzes the cleavage of sialic acid off of the host cell. So this protein attaches to sialic acid, and this protein cuts the sialic acid off and throws it away. Now, when that discovery was made, it struck many scientists as a paradox. Why would the virus have a protein that attaches to sialic acid, and yet another protein that just cuts off that sialic acid and tosses it away? Well, I'll show you what those two proteins do. It turns out that hemagglutinin is important in the very first stage of infection, where the virus lands on a cell, it's a human host cell, the hemagglutinin attaches to the sialic acid and basically allows the protein, uh, or I should say the virus particle, to dock on the cell surface. Once that occurs, it triggers an endocytosis event, where the host cell inadvertently engulfs the viral particle into a vesicle. The membrane of the virus fuses with the membrane of the vesicle and releases the nucleic acid into the cell. And now that viral nucleic acid takes over the machinery of the cell and forces the cell to generate more viral particles. Those viral particles assemble around the membrane of the host cell and eventually a new viral particle buds off the cell surface as I showed in that previous electron micrograph. But remember that with all that hemagglutinin around, that viral particle might get stuck on the cell surface where the sialic acids are. And so the job of neuraminidase is to cut those sialic acids off at that point so that the virus can release itself from the cell and go find another host cell to infect and complete the cycle. So that's why we need these two proteins that act on sialic acid. Now, knowing the importance of neuraminidase, in the viral life cycle, many scientists thought that if one inhibits that enzyme and prevents this very last step in the cycle, one might be able to shut down the propagation of the influenza virus. And so a large drug discovery effort uh, was underway back in the 1990s, even the late 1980s, to develop inhibitors of the neuraminidase enzyme. And that was done by understanding the mechanism of that enzymatic reaction. So the mechanism is shown here. Here's a sialic acid, 
and picture it bound to the surface of, of a cell through a glycan on a glycoprotein or, or a glycolipid. So the R group is the rest of the glycan or the rest of the glycoprotein. What happens during the neuraminidase catalyzed reaction is that there's a cleavage of the bond right here between the sugar uh, ring carbon and this oxygen. That's called the glycosidic bond. And what the enzyme does is it finds a way to make this bond reactive, so this bond is cleaved, and there's a transition state for this reaction in which there's basically a change in the hybridization of the carbon atom at this position, so that it goes from being what we call sp3 hybridized to sp2 hybridized, it becomes planar, and also a positive charge develops on the ring. And then that leads to the formation of this intermediate, and then water from the environment reacts with the intermediate to form a free sialic acid molecule, which then floats away. Well, what several pharmaceutical companies did uh, is to look at the structure of this presumed transition state and try and mimic that structure with these synthetic molecules that are somewhat reminiscent of sialic acid. For example, this compound has the sp2 hybridization at this carbon, similar to the transition state. And so does this compound. This compound has a positive charge in the form of this guanidino group. And this compound has a positive charge in the form of this amino group. These two molecules are actually now on the market as flu drugs. This compound goes by the trade name Relenza, and this compound goes by the name Tamiflu. So if you feel the very, very early symptoms of the flu coming on, you can go to the doctor, get prescription for one or the other of these, and try and prevent the full-blown onset of the flu. Or if someone in your family has been diagnosed with the flu and you're worried that you might catch it, once again, you might take these, one of these two drugs as a preventative measure, as a prophylactic against the flu. So this is a nice example where understanding the glycobiology of influenza led ultimately to the development of drugs to treat the flu. It's a very nice story.